Hello, my name is Darren McKnight, Senior Technical Fellow for Leo Labs, and I have the pleasure of starting off the session on activating active debris removal. The vast majority of the debris generating potential in low Earth orbit for LEO resides in a few hundred massive derelict objects, often abandoned in tight altitude clusters that amplify the probability of significant debris generating event. As early as 2000, all of the major spacefaring agencies identified this pool of several hundred objects. This list provided a clear story, but it did not provide actionable priorities. Recent analysis by a team of 19 global experts from 13 countries reduced this longer list into the top 50 prioritized list. The top 20 objects were 20 SL-16 rocket bodies, 18 of which are centered at 840 kilometers altitude. As a side note, the top 50 objects were roughly 80% abandoned before 2000, roughly 80% rocket bodies, and roughly 80% of Russian Soviet origin. Further, this year, a new analytic tool was created, the LEO Collision Risk Continuum, which examined over 400,000 conjunction data messages, or CDMs, issued by LEO Labs during the last half of 2020. These CDMs included all objects against all objects. The search was not limited to the riskiest conjunctions for the largest objects only. We let the data select the worst offenders. The probability of each conjunction was multiplied by the total mass of the objects included. This served as a surrogate for consequences if a collision ha happened to occur. This total mass involved in each close approach um, was used to obtain a risk value. For this analysis of all objects in the space catalog, the top four items were again, SL-16 rocket bodies. Further, the analysis clearly showed what had been hypothesized in the past from previous analyses. The greatest risk to future debris growth is from potential collisions between massive derelicts abandoned decades ago, not the small, agile, newly deployed small sats populating constellations. Further, there are two altitude regimes that continue to rise up in all analyses as potential hotspots for future debris growth and therefore targets for ADR. These two regions are centered around 840 kilometers and 975 kilometers. While active debris removal, or ADR, as a remediation option is rapid and permanent, there is some benefit to consider the general category of remediate in orbit to work cooperatively with ADR. This may be even more relevant for the most massive objects such as the SL-16s as their removal would definitely require controlled reentry to assure limiting the probability of ground casualty to below the threshold of one in 10,000. Just-in-time collision avoidance, or JCA, and nanotugs are examples of remediate in orbit options. JCA calls for the use of either laser impulse or interaction with a ballistically launched cloud to nudge one of the two derelict objects from an imminent collision. If a JCA solution could be developed that was much less expensive and responsive than ADR and conjunction dynamics accuracy improved, this solution might become a valuable complement to ADR for the most massive of derelict objects. Similarly, a nanotug is simply a small, probably a 6U CubeSat system that could be attached to an abandoned derelict object. The nanotug comprises accelerometers, electric thrusters, GPS receiver to, in essence, bring the derelict object back to life by providing the capability to perform collision avoidance maneuvers as necessary. We are decades beyond the point of urgency of cleaning up mass deposit in LEO decades ago whose collisional churning may adversely affect commercial and national security space system for decades to come. This is especially true for constellations of satellite whose collective exposed area will make them uniquely susceptible to lethal non-trackable debris. So as the popular press and regulators seem to be fixated on constellations as a catalyst for reduced space safety, I propose that the constellations will end up being the victims of decades of complacency in debris remediation and debris mitigation policy and regulation. Thank you for your time.
We recognize the growing hazard of space debris and increasing congestion in Earth's orbit. We welcome all efforts, public and commercial, in debris removal and on-orbit servicing activities, and undertake to encourage further institutional or industrial research and development of these services. My name is Ian Christensen, Director of Private Sector Programs for Secure World Foundation. Those were not my words, but rather are quotes from a joint statement issued by the leaders of the G7 countries after their, after their summit in England earlier this month. The spotlight talk we just heard from Darren McKnight gives us an idea of part of the reasons why the G7 countries might have made this statement. The urgency of the need to address the orbital debris challenge is indeed increasing. Following through on policy statements will require sustained attention to implementation. Technical research and development will surely be needed, but it will also require understanding whether there is economic and business rationale or reason to tackle space debris. In the next 55 minutes, this panel on activating active debris removal <clears throat> plans to dive into these topics. What can we do to spur government and industry alike to get serious about removing orbital debris? We have a panel of experts well-placed to look at this from multiple angles, economics, business, and policy. You can find their full bios on the summit website, but I do want to brief briefly introduce each of them. Asha Balakrishnan is a research staff member at the Science and Technology Policy Institute, a federally funded research and development center that provides analysis of science and technology policy issues for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Recently, she has collaborated with colleagues on a number of reports on space situational awareness, orbital debris issues, space traffic management, and small satellite technologies. Asha holds a degree, a PhD degree in mechanical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Clelia Iacomino is a research fellow at the C-Lab, the Space Economy Evolution Lab of SDA Bocconi School of Management in Milan. She is currently a PhD candidate in management and innovation at the Catholic University of Milan. Research Institute, her research in interests include technological trends regarding, regarding on-orbit servicing, economic theory applied to space debris, and the role of Industry and public sustainability. Luke Gay is the CEO and co founder of Clear Space, a Switzerland based startup based in orbit servicing for sustainable space operations. Luke studied at the EPFL Space Center with a master's degree in electrical engineering. Charity Wheaton is vice president for the space system in the West. She master scales global policy efforts. Spaceflight Safety and Insurance Space System. Charity also serves as the chair of the U.S. Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee on Compact. She holds a master's degree in space operations. I'm excited to get to the discussion and I will start our panelists on this virtual stage. The first brief word on the panels. We will leave plenty of time in this panel for audience questions. Please submit your questions via the Mentimeter website. Our first question today uh, is going to go to Claudia. So, Claudia, we started this uh, conference this morning with a discussion of space's role in addressing climate change. C-Lab has looked at the parallels between the challenges of the debris, the challenges of climate change. Darren's introductory talk. How would you describe the environmental challenge that space debris represents? So thank you, thank you, Ian. Thank you to, to inviting me to in this interesting uh, event. So as uh, C-Lab, we started to study the space debris uh, problems. Uh, and uh, we started, when we started to analyze this problem, we compare the space debris problem ecosystem with the uh, climate change. And uh, we started to, to um, analyze uh, in particular what was happening uh, in the climate change. So the comparison with the, the uh, biosphere degradation, uh, tropical forest loss, uh, so the cumulative uh, problems and the cumulative uh, uh, effects regarding the um, natural ecosystem with uh, the parallel with the orbit ecosystem. 
So let me uh, read a quote that is, was very important for us when we started to compare the orbital, the debris uh, problems with the climate change. So the quote is the, of the professor Alfred, Alfred Kane, that is, uh, was an American professor and an expert in, uh, in regulation. So he developed a theory, the theory of the small decision. He said that the tyranny of the small decision is a situation in which a series of small individual rational decisions cumulatively result in a larger and significant outcome, which is neither optimal nor desired and can negatively change the context of choices, even to the point where desired alternatives are irreversibly destroyed. So it was, uh, uh, this is what, this, what is happening with the space debris and the challenges and the comparison that we did with the uh, natural ecosystem and the orbit ecosystem. Thank you, Clelia. I understand there's some problems with my connection. Um, so hopefully folks can hear me. If not, uh, okay, it sounds like it's better. So we'll We'll try this, and if uh, if my internet goes bad again, we'll uh, have to see if I can have a colleague step in. My apologies here. Um, so, Charity, Luke, the next question is going to be basically the same question for both of you. So maybe if I can have Charity go first, and then Luke um, once Charity finishes. And the, and the question is, uh, what is your company doing to respond to the challenges that Darren and Clelia have just uh, talked about? What near-term mission milestones uh, can we look for from your company? So Charity first, and then to Luke. Thank you. Great. Uh, can you hear me, Ian? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Just wanted to check. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Um, so space sustainability is a growing market and an essential element of a robust space economy. Astroscale is on the leading edge of an emerging on-orbit services market. We're developing technologies, the business models, and driving the policy discussions globally. We support the management of the space environment via life extension, in situ space situation awareness, end of life, which is disposal of prepared objects, and active debris removal, which is disposal of unprepared objects. Key to these missions, what many on-orbit services have in common are rendezvous and proximity operations, docking and capture, automation, and ground support command and control. And this is why our first in-orbit demo for end of life services will naturally advance efforts across all these business lines. Our very own LCD end of life services by Astroscale demo is the first commercial mission to demonstrate end-to-end -end debris docking and removal. And it launched in March of this year and we'll be testing a series of progressively difficult maneuvers to capture a prepared satellite, one equipped with a lightweight docking plate that was stacked with our servicer. LCD has since passed its major operational checkups and we will begin the demonstrations later on this summer. You can track LCD on our website, and we are sharing ephemeris, covariance, and maneuver plans with both ESA and the 18th. Notably, this demonstration is entirely self-funded. LCD is exciting because it's that first demonstration of an end-to-end -end debris docking and removal. Um, we see all debris as a threat to space commerce, exploration, national security, critical services, and our way of life. And while small debris is clearly problematic, it's also important to prevent large debris from becoming smaller pieces of debris by remediating those objects that pose the greatest threat. Last year, Astroscale was selected as commercial partner for JAXA's commercial removal of debris demonstration, phase one, which is the inspection of an upper stage rocket body expected to launch by 2023. Finally, let's not forget space sustainability also involves economic sustainability in orbit. Last year, Astroscale announced its entry into the satellite life extension market, which adds value and ensures effective use of the limited natural resource that is GEO. So I'll just pause there and uh, hand it over to Luke. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this uh, panel. So ClearSpace is a spin-off from the EPFL in Lausanne. Um, it's, it's, initially, it's a team of engineers, uh, EPFL, that's been working since 2010 to find a solution to actually remove space debris from orbit. And the project has initiated after launching a CubeSat straight into the field of debris of the Cosmos Iridium collision, which generated obviously a lot of 
conjunction notifications and uh, and and really brought uh, our team to start thinking through okay what what can what can be done and what should be done to address the growing problem of space debris. Uh, ClearSpace has been spun off in 2018 and we signed a contract with the European Space Agency to lead the first debris removal mission where we have as objective to go pick up a piece of debris that belongs to the European Space Agency um, in orbit and remove it by end of 2025. This mission called Clear Space One is um, is a, is a, is is the first mission to execute the complete value chain of removing a, a piece of debris from orbit, addressing all the different dimension, whether legal legal, legal challenges, uh, liability challenges but also technical challenges and how to actually uh, pick up an un a non-cooperative object in orbit. Uh, today, ClearSpace is about 40 employees. Uh, we work with uh, an extensive industrial team across Europe, and uh, we are in the first phases of the development of our mission. All right, thank you, Charity. Thank you, Luke. And I think we'll have uh, time to come back to some of these activities in, in the subsequent discussions. I'm already seeing um, some questions in the chat that have to do with the specifics of uh, Astra scale and clear space missions. So uh, we'll get to those uh, towards the end of the panel as, as well today here. Um, but I want to turn now to uh, to Asha. Um, so I referenced the G7 statement at the beginning of this uh, panel. And we've also seen in the US national space policy, a goal to evaluate and pursue active debris removal. And in January of this year, we saw the NASA Inspector General uh, issue a report, or Office of the Inspector General issue a, issue a report that argues that mitigation alone is not sufficient and that we need more strategic remediations, uh, strategic remediation activities to address space debris. Uh, can you tell us about the current state of US government activities uh, regarding active debris removal? Sure, thank you for uh, inviting me on to talk about this topic. So um, in addition, in January, not just the OIG um, from NASA issued a report, but the OSTP, the Office of Science Technology Policy of the White House also issued a National um, Orbital Debris Research and Development Plan, which um, laid out some of the research priorities um, for all areas with respect to debris. So there were kind of three major thrusts in that. One was um, debris mitigation. One was tracking and characterization of debris, which is very related to SSA and STM. And the third one, really for the first time in sort of a national level document like this, they um, addressed uh, remediation of debris as a core element or a core area. And they they then further sort of described three particular research and development efforts that um, agencies should move forward with. And these were develop remediation repurposing technologies and techniques for large debris objects, as well as the same type of thing, but not repurposing technologies, but remediation technologies and techniques for small debris objects. So similar to kind of what Darren was talking about, there are many ways to go about this in that paper of 50 derelict objects. They're very large ones that 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 one could, could um, try and, and remove for the purposes of removing risk long-term. But then there's also a lot of discussion with respect to lethal non-trackable debris that's, you know, could be mission ending. And so they identified two areas. And then the third one, which I think is a really uh, important area, and it's one that I think a lot of the people on this panel have talked about is developing models for risk and cost benefit analysis. And I think that everybody, sort of feels like there are models out there, they may touch on some aspects of risk or some aspects of um, a certain type of debris, but we really haven't seen sort of a holistic model looking at all of the trade-offs between, um, uh, between the impacts of uh, the probabilities as well as the different orbits and the regimes and the, and, and the sort of the numbers of satellites that are going up in that area and not just technical risk, but also economic risk as well. Um, I would say that the last thing is, you know, we do need better data. So that tracking and characterization piece that is part of the R&D plan is a really important piece because the models are only as good as the data that we have. And I I fear that for the large debris, we have you know better data and there's more work going on with some of the NC2 SSA and, and some improvements in space fence and coming online and those kinds of things. But I think on the small debris scale, we don't have um, as much good data that has really, um, 
good accuracy to it to really understand the environment enough. So I would say lastly on the ADR technology and where the where the US government is, I think they're still in the, this is a long-term thing and that there is no one agency that has the mission nor the funding to do this. And so that's where we're stuck. We're stuck with that when it comes to space traffic management. We're stuck with that when it comes to, to ADR as well. So I feel like there needs to be a little bit of a unsticking in, in the government realm. <laughs> yeah, and indeed the, the who, uh... And then what one agency in that question is one that is, is coming up in several different areas of U.S. space policy right now and um, seems to be good. Well, it's good not immune to it either. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think maybe uh, that might, again, be another one that we come back to here um, as, as we go, because I think that relates, um, it certainly relates to the previous panel with the space traffic management question, and it relates to this as well. So um, speaking of the previous panel, um, that previous panel, we just had a good discussion of some of the challenges that, that the uh, policy and regulatory structure for these large constellations uh, pose. And the, the, the topic of debris uh, certainly came up in that discussion uh, um, as well. Darren in his talk suggested that these large constellation operators might actually potentially be a victim of um, some of this regulatory tension in that uh, the existing risk from the large objects is, is where some of the, the, the real challenges and the, these constellations are operating in that environment, right? Um, so I, I want to pose a question uh, to you, Charity. Your company has worked with one of these large constellation operators and some technology development uh, programs uh, along with the European Space Agency. Uh, what is the role of the large constellation community in addressing uh, the debris challenge on orbit? Uh, well, yeah, just great to, to point out that Astroscale did announce a partnership with OneWeb in May to develop an ELSA that can conduct multiple end-of-life disposals. And, you know, per your comment on Darren, he's he always does make good points. Uh, derelict debris, approximately 8,000 tons of it, is a real threat to operators in orbit. However, as we increase the use of orbit, we need to prevent additions to this derelict population, right? So any additions pose a threat to creating those lethal non-trackable that uh, Asha was talking about, but also interrupt critical services and commerce by requiring more collision avoidance maneuvers. So even if they deorbit de within the international norm of 25 years, they're still creating a uh, perturbation, if you will, on uh, the, the normal operations in orbit. Large constellations are exciting and they bring a wealth of benefits to us here on Earth. And I personally know people in communities who are benefiting from the proliferation of access to space, but we can't add to the population of debris in space now. And, and we need to be responsive to new hazards and congestions. Uh, so this means one of two things for constellation providers and really all operators in space. Either ensure high, high reliability of satellites, which might be rather expensive, or have a plan for a controlled disposal at end of mission. Regulators under Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty need to make sure one of these two options happen. And there's no middle ground here in terms of space safety. So what does this mean and how do we get from here? That's the you know, major question at hand. Uh, I, I feel the first step is to measure accurately what that risk of a system is, meaning the entire system's risk needs to be measured for probability of collision. Next, we need to cap that risk. No one wants excessive or unlimited risk in this business. It would simply drive investors away. And third, proper monitoring is needed of this risk profile that constellations are imposing on the space environment. Right now, there are educated guesses of, at best, of how a constellation may impact the environment. How about a near real-time update as the system is deployed? And finally, there is no use making limits if regulators aren't going to enforce said limits. So sure, customer access to the benefit of a constellation should be economic, natural economic driver to limit debris. But what if it's not? Well, then governments are ultimately liable for private operator activity. So there should be financial carrots and sticks, as Asha mentioned, the economic drivers here, that drive responsible behaviors in space and limit debris. So uh, just foot stomping, we're all in this together. Operational satellites, that can maneuver around debris are good things. Transparency and information sharing among operators to understand who's doing what is a good thing. Space situational awareness is a good thing. Space traffic coordination and management is a good thing. But inactive satellites without collision avoidance, raining down through operational orbits and human spaceflight 
is not a good thing. And I don't care if that takes two, five or 25 years to deorbit. I count current large debris objects among the items that are not conducive to a successful space environment or space economy. Thank you, Jerry. And we're seeing, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in in the, the audience here. So this is good. Um, I've got a couple more I want to ask um, that we that we discussed in advance, but we're going to get to those uh, those audience questions. So keep them coming. Um, so clearly, this next one uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to turn to you. So both Asha and Charity now have mentioned the need to create economic incentives and possibly, um, you know, the consequences and 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 enforcement penalties that that might come along with that. Um, from your standpoint, uh, does the rise of large constellations does that pose or offer uh, any sort of solution or, or relationship to the economic challenge of addressing space debris? Does it kind of change the way that we think about the economics of the space debris challenge? So this was the, the point that uh, helped us as a research center when we started uh, our resort. So, and in particular, the question that uh, Guide has was, uh, is the market that can solve the problem of the space debris or we need uh, the uh, government intervention in order to solve this kind of problem. So I, I did before the parallel with the climate change that uh, was a useful example to understand the role of the public and also the private sector. For sure, the, this question, so is, is the market that, that can solve this problem? So we try to answer to this question um, through a simulation of different scenarios. So, so we try to understand, first of all, the risk. So if the risk of collision is in the medium term, or sorry, in the short term, in the medium term, on the long term, so this uh, for sure change the position of the private sector in order to invest in such technologies. And we started, first of all, to understand which kind of technologies the private sector can use and have the economic incentive to use in order to avoid and to solve the problem of the space debris. And we, um, we uh, analyze the, the, the mitigation of, for example, post-mission disposal or collision avoidance technologies, active debris removal technology. So we saw that this technology in effect uh, uh, mitigate the risk of, of collision. And in particular, the, the post-mission disposal solution was uh, uh, in our uh, in our uh, point of view, uh, first of all, a, a good solution to solve to mitigate the collision because we saw the curve of the risk uh, lower than uh, the the curve of the risk of collision. So this this was the the in uh, in our conclusion a cheap solution for the private sector in order to have economic incentive. In, to invest and to use the post-mission disposal. For sure, if the risk is in the short term, if the risk in other scenarios so, uh, that was in the long term, I don't think that the private sector would use this kind of solution. So to use its, uh, their fuel in order to deorbit the satellites. So I think that in the long term scenario we saw and I think that the private sector um, decided to, to leave their satellites to, uh, to fail to, to, to the orbit. And I think that in this case, the active debris removal is needed for the dead satellite in this case. But uh, also for, uh, for the active debris removal is a, a question that I ask to myself, but also uh, when uh, I, I talk with my colleagues uh, is that, uh, uh, is there the market for the active debris removal? Yeah, so uh, I, you're hitting on, I think, a number of themes there, right? One that we've, already, we've, we've talked a lot already in this panel about the need to have a good understanding characterization of the technical and economic risk and being able to communicate that across actors. You're also talking about, you know, active debris removal is part of an overall scope of um, responses that operators need to talk you need to take here, including, you know, simply uh, post-mission disposal compliances is important and operators need to defend the business plan. So, uh, Luke, uh, turning to you now. So, Clelia talked about, you know, whether if there is or is not a private market for active debris, remo debris removal, your company is trying to find that market, right? That is what both you and then part and then part of Astroscale's business as well, right? Um, 
So uh, outside of technology, what factors do we need to have further development in uh, to enable the commercial debris removal market? Well, I think I think to to uh, to reflect on what has been said until now, I, I agree with Darren. I write that large objects are a major issue and have to be addressed. And I agree with Charity that we have to uh, build up a solution that is sustainable for the future. I think the first thing is that we, we have to overall generally, whether if it's agencies uh, or commercial uh, commercial operation, recognize the complete cost of space operation. And the complete cost of space operation means the complete cost of a sustainable space operation. And in this cost, removal of debris has to be included. You you cannot consider that. You, you looked at the complete mission, say, okay, now it flies. We paid for it. We operated We operated this platform or this satellite for a while. Everything's okay, uh, whether it fails or not in orbit. And often what has been done in the past is that when you look at the overall cost of a space mission, you, you would go all the way up, up to the point where the, the satellite fails in orbit or is deorbited if, if it has been deorbited. And I think that this is not the complete cost. The complete the, the complete cost should include also the deorbiting. Uh, and specifically, I mean, in, in if you follow the, the logic of Darren, specifically for, for the most dangerous and problematic uh, um, uh, objects in orbit to start with. And this means that the first thing that has to happen is that agencies has have to start looking at the object they have in orbit and say, okay, what kind of budget can we put in place to make sure that we don't produce a situation which will affect everyone in the future? But then beyond that, I think this has to be also integrated in the business case for commercial operators. And the question then is, what is the dynamics, the financial dynamics that makes that the payment of that kind of service is just a natural uh, a step of, of, a, of a complete business case? So um, I think this, this dimension is really important. Uh, regulation, we have a lot of regulation today that are in place already. Um, there's a lot of things that, that are just not applied. Um, I think, uh, and, and the other part that is happening right now that we can see happening much faster than we actually expected when we created their space is the is the, the conscience of the problem, right? Uh, I remember for years before we created their space, people would tell us, nobody will ever pay for that. Nobody will ever pay for the orbiting mission. Why would anybody pay for that? doesn't make any sense, right? You're just removing a piece of debris to make space for the others. I mean, it's, it's the tragedy of the commons. There's no reason why somebody should ever pay for that. And when we created Clear Space, when we founded the company at the beginning, we thought it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard to find investors, so we should find sponsors right, to actually make a demonstration. And uh, we were surprised to see how quickly everything evolved. And we see that the timing is right to affect change today. So what has to be done is first, I think that uh, agencies start thinking about the object they have in orbit. I think what's interesting actually in the list of the 50 most dangerous object in orbit is that there's not a single American one in the list, well, there's just one. Um, I think uh, there, there should be more transparency about what's up there. There should be a conscience in the in the agency start and think, okay, how, how do we put in place a budget that makes sure that we that we increase the space of operational orbits. There's some orbits where Constellation already cannot operate today, uh, which are there's some orbits where you can already see Kessler syndromes appearing, right? So you you see that happening already today. It's a very slow evolving uh, uh, a problem, but it's it's already there. So the first step for me is I think is those lists. I agree with Darren that those lists of 50 objects have to be addressed. And, and agree with charity, we have to build up the constellations in a way that takes in account all the different outcomes of an uh, end of mission and actually just addresses them in a consistent and logical way. Thank you, uh, Luke. And you've, um, you, you've, you've teed up the, the, net, the question that I want to start with from the audience. Um, we, we almost like we planned this, but, we, but, but it just worked out this way. So you were, you were talking at the end of that remark about um, how to you know communicate the value and the need to start working on these top 50 objects and to start working on on integrating you know this into the business case of the large constellations and designing those to, to operate safely and sustainably um so um the the question yeah so the the, the question i'm going to put up on the screen here shortly um here and i'm going to ask asha to start and then the other panelists to come in um so asha as we try to communicate the need uh, to 
address debris to remove the large objects to figure out how to field active debris removal services how should we how should we as a community community be communicating that to lawmakers and to policymakers is there anything you've seen in your experience uh where messaging has worked well or, or perhaps has not and then i'll let the other panelists come in as, as they as they think there um so i haven't seen much in my experience in terms of like moving this forward to get get sort of the the you know, SSA and STM, you know, we're still waiting on that. Uh, I think that with respect to ADR, though, one thing that I think might work if we, if, if not we, I'm not an advocate here, but if, if one was to pull a story together about the cost now versus the cost later, I think you have to think about, you know, it might seem expensive now with lots of dollar signs or euros, but if you waited and it created a more kind of much more untenable situation down the line than the cost to remove millions of pieces of debris if things ended up colliding or, you know, so that that comes back to the data and that comes back to the models. So we need to be able to have really robust models with good data, right? Not data that we took, you know, in shuttle windows in 2011 or 20, you know, 2009 for, 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 um, predicting what the debris environment is. We need really, you know, good data on the small debris side as well as the large one to feed into these models so we can convince ourselves of understanding, you know, what does it look like down the line? And if we did this now, yes, it's going to cost money, but it's going to cost a lot less than if we did it later. Yeah. Thank you for that. Charity? Um, Asha reminds me of a great quote from Darren. Um, uh, pay me now or pay me more later is, is essentially what he says. There's a good paper at IAC on that. Recommend everyone read that. Um, and just, just to quickly add on, this really comes down to domestic priorities, right? Those policy priorities. Uh, clearly, Europe and Japan uh, have made it a priority to invest in research and development for debris removal. And therefore, there are programs. And I, I feel that ADR and just generically on our services writ large, check a lot of domestic priority boxes for the United States in particular, of international collaboration, te technology development, growing the industry, national security, application to exploration, and just simple leadership, you know, being involved and in making sure that the United States is, is involved in uh, ensuring, you know, the norms and, and leading the rules and the norms and behavior on this sort of activity as well. So, I, the stars are aligned. Uh, it just needs action like other domestic priorities do. I mean, I think we could certainly interpret the, the G7 statement as, you know, a recognition of wanting to take that leadership that, that you're talking about there, Terry. But, you know, it's now it's a good statement. Let's work on the on the follow through and yeah. providing that, that story and, and implementation that needs to be provided. Um, all right, so uh, we are fully into the audience Q and A portion here. So um, we're going to jump around to some uh, to some different subjects here as we go. But um, I'm sure the same some same commonality and, and threads will come up. Um, so uh, the the next one um, kind of goes uh, towards uh, you know spurring action and, and some of the tools that we might or might not use. Um, and so, Kalili, I'm going to put you on the spot uh, to, to answer this first, and then other panelists might uh, might come in because there's a little bit of economic theory behind this. That, um, so uh, with, with a prize model or a bounty model, uh, provide an effective incentive uh, to remove some of these hazardous objects uh, that we're talking about. Yes, it was, was mentioned before, so I think that uh, uh, if we demonstrate uh, that uh, the risk uh, is now, so is not in the long term, but is in the short term, I think that is an important point to, um, to change the government attitude to fund, uh, to fund the technologies uh, or to fund uh, the private sector in order to take the action uh, to mitigate the debris, um, the space debris. So th this is the, the point that I want to stress about the, to understand, to demonstrate uh, the, um, the, the risk, because this is the one point that can convince the governments to take an action. 
and it was was happening with the the environment the, on Earth. So um, before you mentioned that if we we pay now and invest now in the future, we you know, we will have uh, uh, less cost about to invest to technologies, and this is true. So if we invest now to the technologies that to help the private sector in order to avoid and to mitigate the risk. Also, there are several options that the government can do is to, fa to fund the technologies or through the public-private partnership is a good solution in order to, um, to invest in technologies such as active debris removal because we know that the active debris removal is a, a costly solution if we, we compare these technologies with the other technology technologies. So, so this is was uh, we, we um, the the logic that uh, we 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 did when we started our research. So to understand to compare the cost of the different solution, and we know that the active debris removal is a costly technologies, and there is the need of the government to co-fund this kind of solution, and the public-private partners could be um, so an option in order to to help. Uh, the private sector. Yeah, so that's a, an interesting suggestion that, that the use of the, the PPP model, which we've seen for other areas of, of kind of um, government and, and commercial cooperation on, on space system development with success might be something that, that we look at here. And I think there are, there are elements of public private partnership in both some of the, both the clear space mission and some of the, uh, the Astro scale partnerships as well. So I think that is something that the governments are, are, are looking at. Um, all right, so um, the next round of questions is going to be a lightning round for our Astroscale and ClearSpace colleagues. We have a lot of questions um, in the chat about uh, where you guys are going, what your missions look like, and, and how you interact with each other. So uh, Asha and Clelia, I mean, you can chime in if you have anything on there, but it might be a brief break for you. So um, putting a question up, but uh, the, the first question, just to kind of get started here, um, ClearSpace and Astroscale, are you guys competitors and are there others in your market space if you are? So uh, Luke and, <laughs> Luke and uh, Charity, I don't know who wants to, who wants to take that one on, but, but go for it. I think, I think to be competitor, there should be the market already, probably. Uh, um, uh, it, it is, uh, we, we have regular interactions and, and, and we obviously uh, uh, see each other because we, uh, we are trying to produce the same change in the industry, maybe with a different approach in different regions. Um, but at the end, we, what we see is that the market, uh, when it activates to, to actually address all that, requires more than both of our companies to actually address the complete problem. So there, there, there's plenty of room uh, to do a lot of work. Um, right, right now, what we can see is that we, we are active. Well, in Europe, we're active together. Uh, AstroScale is active in, in the UK. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, we, we are on a European mission, AstroScale is on a Japanese mission. Uh, the question is how far uh, can international collaboration work? Uh, and, and that's one of the questions that will at some point come up, uh, mostly also because uh, for many, the uh, ADR technologies are considered as dual use, right? And there, there can be limitations and strategic interests from different countries around that. Um, but yeah, I, th I think at the end we, we we might likely end up competing on on, the, on some market and collaborating some others. Uh, I'll just echo some of what Luke said. Uh, maybe less competitors and more pioneers, aren't we, Luke? Uh, in this space, uh, and and really, this industry needs to be collaborative at this moment, very moment. We need to get together to build those policy and best practices to conduct these operations safely. A, a small difference between our companies, I, I feel Astroscale is looking at a whole suite of on-orbit services in a, a number of orbits. ADR is just one of those missions, right? If, if you can rendezvous with uh, a, another object in orbit, you can provide in situ SSA, life extension, you know, um, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just a shout out to those industry associations and industry groups that are driving best practices and making sure this is a sustainable and safe um, market is the consortium for the execution of rendezvous and servicing. Of course, there's other ad hoc groups like the Space Safety Coalition. Uh, and I know that, uh, you know, probably Luke's company and, and Astros here, we're, we're part of many, many discussions with our industry colleagues. So it, it needs to be collaborative. 
Thank you. And you know, so we had a question there that I think you already both have already spoken to about whether you're you know, doing the same thing or our definitive differences is a little bit of a little bit of both. Right. I like charity. I like the phrasing, you know, pioneers, uh, not competitors. Right. Because, you know, as Luke said, you know, make the market and then compete for the market. Um, so, uh, Luke, you've already teed up the next question um, very nicely. Um, you keep doing that for me. So thank you. Um, <laughs> The, uh, there's a question from the audience. Um, so Luke, you mentioned there's some potential dual use implications of, of some of this technology, right? That, that for, for ADR or for servicing. Um, so the question is, are your companies doing anything to make sure that ADR operations don't create security concerns? And so what is the relationship between, you know, civil ADR technology that we're talking about in this panel and some of the, the national security implications uh, that that might have? I, I think for uh, to do a mission that has a national security implication, you have to be placed on the right orbit. You, you have to get uh, an authorization to launch. Um, this means that uh, you would have either to have an authorization by launching state that, that actually knows what you're planning to do, uh, because you have to provide a lot of content, a lot of detail about what you're going to do in orbit, especially if you're you know, in orbit servicing. This is already quite a deterrent. The other aspect is that um, we look at it for us, it's quite obvious that the solution we're building is, is a sustainability solution. That, that's what we're after. That's what we try to build. And, and I'm, I'm certain the Astro scale as well. Uh, we want to address a fundamental problem. And um, uh, in our perspective, there, there's a lot of dimension that can make, uh, if, if you want to dehabilitate or, or, or break a satellite or a, 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 a military satellite, you, you, you don't necessarily need to actually capture it. You, you, you need to collide with it. You need to do other stuff. Um, and there's probably ways that are much more uh, cost effective to actually uh, do that than actually do the complete exercises we, we do it. Uh, in addition to that, I think that it's, it's a little like uh, an ambulance. You don't use an ambulance for warfare, uh, mostly because you know that if you start to do that, the cost benefits in terms of, of, of your complete exercise makes it uh, illogical. Right, it, you you have more to lose than to win if you if you start using it this way. So that that's the way we look at it. Maybe it's a little naive when it comes to military application, but for us, it's clearly uh, the, the approach is very clearly and has to remain a, a sustainability uh, solution that we we are building here. Nevertheless, it's a solution that is dual use and will be classified as dual use. Um, what we export and what we how we addressed it because the question obviously came in from the Swiss government when we uh, when we started working on the first mission for ESA the question came up and it, it comes up on a regular basis what we export is a service and not uh, not the spacecraft or the technology itself. Uh, I'll just add that Astroscale categorically is against the deliberate creation of debris in orbit. Okay. That is incredibly important, and that is our ethos and the reason why we stood up as a company. Beyond that, the government, uh, sort of point fingers here, can be the worst offender of debris generating, um, uh, debris generation in orbit, especially the last six decades. So we feel that government should be customers of our services, right, to prevent um, debris incidents from occurring. Um, just, you know, echoing Luke, uh, uh, you know, private operators are regulated uh, by domestic, um, uh, domestic uh, nations, and therefore we have to adhere to space safety standards. Uh, we also are pushing norms of behavior, best practices in this, uh, skate, in this uh, market as well. And, you know, as I said, we're regulated and want to develop uh, solutions, not create problems. So that's all I say about that. Right. Thank you. And I think, you know, an important point that I think both of you are talking about, right, is, you know, we, we discussed earlier transparency and sharing of information, right? And there's going to be you know, yeah. uh, a civil commercial mission. There's going to be, a, you know, an emphasis on transparency and, and, and information sharing. At least we hope that helps to distinguish those sorts of activities from something that might be um, might be more national security in, in nature. Um, so uh, thank you, Charity and Luke, for the uh, clear space and Astro scale uh, portion of this uh, of this questioning. I'm going to try and open up to a broader question now. Um, the number of questions in the chat about you know um, removing uh, spent rocket bodies, right? And we know the majority of those bodies are are Russian and um, and some Chinese ones as well, right? From the top fifty list. Um, 
there's a there's a legal and policy question here around uh, permissions to to use to remove those objects, responsibility to remove those objects, and liability associated with that. Right. So, uh, a, a broad question about what legal and policy tools can we think about to address nations uh, that do not consent to the removal of their derelict objects, or to encourage those nations to uh, to start participating in removal of those objects. So. Um, open to anyone on the panel who wants to, to try to take that thorny issue on. Did that not come through? No, we can hear you. We, it's a little better now though. Um, I'm not gonna be able to answer that question. I think that's a really, really hard question. I think we're all sort of silent because we don't know. This is really an international cooperation diplomacy issue. I mean, this has to, this cannot be solved by technology development. When one of the things that we, when we um, helped support sort of the orbital debris uh, R&D plan, we looked at, okay, what are the big challenges in orbital debris? You know, irrespective of R&D, what are the major challenges? And then what can R&D solve? And R&D can solve some of the challenges, but they cannot solve the liability challenge. They cannot solve, you know, um, post-mission disposal, people complying with the 25 year rule. They cannot solve, the, the registration challenge. And so these are things that have to happen on the diplomatic efforts. And, you know, I, I'm now going to step back and feign that, you know, although I'm a panel policy analyst, I'm an engineer and I'm not a diplomat, so. Uh, I'll add, Ian, that w when we say we look to leadership uh, of this sort of issue, this is what we're talking about. Uh, we'd like to see nations get together and discuss what is that pathway forward? Um, before technology catches up <laughs> to that to that eventuality, because technology will run fast here, and um, we hope that uh, nations will be able to have an open dialogue and come to some sort of solution. And, and, and I think I, if I can also add to it, um, I, I think that there's some there's some good news in in the complete in, in the situation. There have been collaboration where objects from different countries including russia and us docked in orbit right mm -hmm. and th this happened in the past this kind of collaboration was possible in the past and uh this is a field where we have to put aside where governments have to put aside uh competition on on a military scale to really look into collaborating to address a common problem and uh it if it has been possible for the iss it has to be possible for debris removal and because because we all coexist in the same environment, we all benefit from the same environment. And this cannot be treated in in a usual competitive way. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, we are unfortunately almost coming to the end of our time already. Um, there are well too many questions in the chat that I'm going to be able to get to, but I do want to um, go one round around the table here with a with a wrap up question and give everybody a minute and a half to try to uh, to try to wrap up all of the great thoughts um, in a very brief time. So um, in the spotlight talk, Darren told us or suggested that we are decades beyond urgency in addressing the orbital debris challenge. Um, so in a, in a minute and a half or so, what is the immediate next step that we must take to start addressing that urgency and to start solving that 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 gap? So um, just go around. Um, I will pick on uh, Charity to start. Um, see at the bottom Lucky of the screen. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I think that's a great approach. You know, a lot of folks are thinking of active debris removal of, you know, oh, it's decades away and we have time, but we don't have time. So what can we do now, right, right now? Uh, and then what do we build on uh, to get ready? So I, I really think domestic national priority on space environment management, active debris removal, whatever you wanna call it, make it a priority, make it a statement and, and have that drive the discussions of who owns it, how are we gonna fund the R&D uh, aspects to it? How are we gonna develop the PPP and the economic models? How are we gonna do the international pieces? But it all starts with you know, laying down the policy. All right. So get the policy right, Luke. Yep. Well, there's not much to add to what Charity just said. That's, uh, I think for us, we see it exactly the same way. I think uh, governments have to, to, lead the, to, to lead the first efforts. It's, in Europe, it's already the case. I think ESA demonstrates that uh, today there's more 
uh, European uh, agencies that are starting looking into that. So, so this is moving in Japan as well. And I think this should be a global effort. There's another dimension, it's really this dimension of building up international collaboration to address uh, to address those problems. And that's something that has to be uh, driven probably with a very similar model that what has been done for, for the ISS. Lelia, you're next on my screen. So I, I think in my opinion that uh, I'm a researcher. So what uh, is my my job is to to understand the different solution that we have on the table. So and we discussed uh, the different solution about the PPP solution. But uh, if we go through this uh, way, uh, we have to think about uh, if there is a market to sustain this. Uh, uh, PPP model and to understand uh, how the business model of active breed removal is based on. It's based on to give profit to private sector or to save the profits. So this is a distinction that is important to understand how to develop a sustainable business model of the active breed removal. So this is the first uh, um, thing that uh, that uh, uh, I wanted to share with you, but the second thing is that if it's not sustainable, so if uh, it's not sustainable, the PPV model of it is not sustainable uh, to think about is the, if the market uh, can have the incentive, economic incentive to solve this problem alone, for sure we need the intervention of, of legislation. So, and to think about uh, if we need uh, for budding legislative intervention or if if we need uh, um, other solution, for example, to pay a fee. So each satellite operator pay a fee in order to invest in, uh, in this kind of technical solution. So depends on the risk, as I said before, if the risk is now or if the risk is a uh, long term. And then to position an intervention on the public and private sector in different way along this timeline. And Asha. Last word. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm going to give two since I have the last word. Um, one is I really do think we have to develop these these risk and cost benefit models that Clelia is talking about and and develop them in a holistic way that's transparent and people buy into. So I think we really need the evidence behind whatever next steps are going to take. I would say. Secondly, and I do not speak on behalf of anybody, I speak on behalf of myself and representing, you know, the Science Technology Policy Institute, I do not represent the US government here. But I do think that the US is losing an opportunity to get in on uh, in terms of technology development in ADR technology and to, to help um, to both look at their own missions as uh, as an example of a customer to use these technologies down the line, but also to drive to buy down risk and try and better understand some of the challenges that we have on the policy side, on some of the concerns we have on the legal and policy side, and work that out. It it, it can't we can't admire the problem so much more unless we go forward and do it. And in order to do it, we need action from at least in the U.S. We do need some direction on which agency is going to take the lead in doing it and who's going to be funded to do it. Yeah. All right. So thank you all. Um, so, you know, to, to, to activate active debris removal, we need, uh, we need to know that governments must act. We need to get environmental management, space environmental management policy in place, international cooperation. It was essential. We have some models that we can consider for that. The ISS cooperation, public private partnerships, uh, then we really need to understand what the technical and cost benefit risks and analyses are uh, in sustainable active debris removal businesses models and the uh, the overall risk portfolio in orbit. Um, and we have to look for opportunities for leadership and, and we need a U.S. government um, champion to step up and, and take this responsibility. So uh, very simple, straightforward steps that we need to do, but um, I'm sure that... Uh, Sure that we have ample opportunity to continue this conversation and we've identified some good uh, some good work to go forward so thank you to the panelists i wish we could keep talking uh thank you to the audience for the great for the uh the number of questions that were submitted uh, again i wish we could get to them all but we certainly had a good discussion um i want to welcome my colleague uh, crystal back uh up on stage our conference chair here to take us out for the day thank you all right well thank you ian and thank you again to all of our panelists from all three of 
our sessions today. I really couldn't be happier with what we've been able to bring you, with the discussions that we've had, and with the opportunities for follow-up that this gives us. So just to let you all know, this is day one. We're concluding now. Um, starting tomorrow, we're going to have another day of packed content for you, uh, two panels, uh, one on the space race, or what we really should call it, the second on the space force and what should be really focusing on what should be its prime directive. And then I'm also incredibly pleased to offer you two keynotes. One is an interview style keynote uh, with Tori Bruno from ULA, and one is Bobby Law, a senior advisor at NASA, to hear a little bit about the Biden administration's priorities on space sustainability. So join us tomorrow. If you know anyone else you'd like to invite, please have them register. And we are excited for our event to continue. Thank you so much.